What's up, y'all? This is Zach on the Living Corporate Podcast, and it's a Saturday. If you're listening to it, when we air it, right? And you're listening to uh, See It To Be It. See It To Be It is a great show that I'm not the host of, but I'm like a B-mic, you know. And uh, shoot, I'll let Amy talk a little bit about the guest that we have for uh, See It To Be It today. Yeah, I was really excited to land this guest, um, Zach, this week. So Celia Daniels is, she's amazing. I mean, she just does everything. She does everything. She's a an IT consultant at the highest levels of management consulting in the IT space in healthcare. She is an activist in the trans community, and she's on the board for Trans Can Work, which is an organization in California that's doing remarkable things for the trans community, helping um, trans people be gainfully employed, which seems like a no-brainer, right? You want the best person for the job. The person happens to be trans. You hire them. No big deal. But man, that's not the case, and it's a shame because there are so many people out there that are so talented, like Celia, who struggle to find work just because of people's prejudices. And, you know, as we were talking in the interview, I found out not only is she all of those things, she's also a songwriter, a singer, a guitar player. (laughs) She, I mean, she really does everything. And um, so we talk a lot in this interview about, you know, her experience, not just as a trans woman, but as an immigrant, as someone from India and all the different spaces that she occupies and what that looks like. I mean, that sounds incredible. I can't wait to one to hear the interview. I'm really excited about it. You know, we talked about the guest and I, I can't wait to hear what they, uh, what they got. Yeah. But before we get there, let's go ahead and make sure we tap in with Tristan for his latest career tip. What's going on living corporate. It's Tristan. And I want to thank you for tapping back in with me as I provide some tips and advice for professionals. This week, let's talk about requesting to work from home indefinitely. With COVID-19 cases on the rise in nearly every state throughout the U.S., many professionals are either continuing to work from home or transitioning back to work from home. According to a recent survey of 4,000 people by FlexJobs, 65% said they would prefer to work from home full-time after the pandemic. In that same survey, 95% of respondents say productivity has been higher or the same while working remotely. So, if you fall on this number, here's how you can request a more permanent work-from-home arrangement. First, you'll want to set up a meeting with your boss in HR. Fast Company provides a really good template for this email, and we'll link to it in the show notes. Next, you'll want to create a proposal that you can present at the meeting. This proposal should include an outright request to work from home permanently, your reasoning for the request, any professional benefits from a permanent arrangement, and an outline of your potential schedule and team communication plan. Fast Company provided an excellent example that is also within the link in the show notes. If your boss is a little apprehensive about the arrangement, ask them what their concerns are and develop a plan to address those. If they still aren't in, consider a hybrid schedule where you're in the office a few days a week and at home for the other days. Thanks for tapping in with me this week. I look forward to talking to you next week. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. My guest today is Celia Daniels. Celia is an Asian Indian, non-op, trans woman of color. She's an entrepreneur, musician, photographer, storyteller, activist, and filmmaker. She writes and speaks passionately about the struggles and challenges she faced in her family, work, and community, both in the United States and in India. As a management consultant with Fortune 100 companies, Celia educates, empowers, and advocates for transgender and gender non-binary individuals in the business world. Celia brings an amazing intersectional blend of ethnicity, creativity, culture, religion, and corporate experience to her activism. She received the 2019 Human Rights Campaign Equality Award for outstanding commitment and service to our community. She is currently on the executive board for Trans Can Work and the VP of Stonewall Democrats of Ventura County. Please welcome to the show Celia Daniels. 
Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be on a show. <laughs> well, it's an honor to have you here. I first learned about Trans Can Work at a Reaching Out MBA event, gosh, a couple of years ago when I saw Michaela. Oh, yes. Michaela Mendelssohn. Yeah. Michaela Mendelssohn. Yeah. yeah. I saw her speak and I, she just did such a tremendous job and she was, you know, she was so very uh, relatable in, you know, in the panel discussion that she had around the issues that trans folks faced at work and, mm-hmm. you know, the opportunities and all of the talent that we're leaving on the table by excluding people from the workforce. And so we have so much to cover today because I know that you're on the board for Trans Can Work and you have you know a bio that, that goes on forever. I mean, you're a musician and a filmmaker and a consultant and you do all of these amazing things. But I guess where I really like to start is you know, your background is in consulting strategically in, in the healthcare space. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit how you got into that work? Yeah, absolutely. I think when I came to this country in the late, I would say in the late 90s, I was working with some of the first healthcare companies. I was working with the HMO. Uh, I was managing certain projects for them. And then I realized that I was getting involved with the payer side of, I would say, the healthcare industry. So I was working with Blue Cross. I worked with Aetna, which is now, you know, it's all evolving from a blues And then I was also working with United uh, Insurance. So mostly in the insurance side, I I worked quite a bit on that. And then I slowly started working in the pharmaceutical space and biotechnology companies. So in my experience that I have, um, you know, in my professional experience, I've been working as a strategy consultant and also helping them in the IT strategy, coming up with ideas in terms of growing business, expanding business giving them strategic ideas that can help them save costs, operating expenses, you know, all the, all the, the, the usual stuff, people process technology, all that. So I worked in that entire space and I was doing really well. And that's how I got into this space. And I'm still consulting. In fact, I, my passion is more in the life sciences space. So I still consult for the biotechs and biopharmaceutical companies in Southern California and Northern California. There's so much in that, right? Because you have to have the engineering background, you have to have the business savvy, you have to be able to see things holistically, uh, you know, to do to do strategy. Right. Like, where did you start with that? Did you start from an engineering background or from a business background? Or were you, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. that's a lot all at once. So I'm guessing yeah. you started in one place and sort of expanded. So absolutely. I, my my uh, education is I've done my master's in computer science and my yeah. degree in computer science back in India. And uh, after finishing my degree, I was, um, you know, I'm a programmer. I was working on lots of programs. I've written uh, programs for uh, molecular modeling. I worked on the first silicon graphics workstation that came to India. I think the second silicon graphics workstation that came to India. I worked on molecular modeling, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and then DNA protein synthesis. I worked on crystallography projects back in India, um, which was one of the first human genome projects. And my experience was more in the computer science background, and I was absolutely writing code. And uh, I was a coder, you know, I was absolutely coding, and I really enjoyed programming. And then came a time where I had to, you know, my company needed my expertise more talking to clients and interacting with them, building that relationship. Uh, beyond coding. And I was uh, good at that. My CEO at the time, he said, hey, uh, you, you'll you do good and why don't you do it? You know, I said, no, I'm, I'm just a programmer. I don't want to be that way. <laughs> but um, I slowly transitioned into a part where I got into business development and I started helping growing accounts. I was a partner in the company and that's how I grew in my career pretty fast. But I kind of lost my programming experience, but I do relate to the fact that I can, you know, when someone is doing coding in Python now, I'm like, oh my God, tell me how did you do it? (laughs) I'm so excited about it. So I really love, and that's how I got into the whole programming background to management experience that I have today. Absolutely. I love that you were able to come in in one place and make your footprint bigger. And I think that happens to so many of us, right? We find a, a niche that we think, ooh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be right here and I'm going to do this. And then someone sees the potential in us to do more and kind of, you know, thrust that upon us and we have no choice but to figure it out. And so, you know, so many times I'll hear people say, well, I just want to focus. I just want to focus. I'm like, you get to do that for a while. And then, you know, at some point you get tapped on the shoulder to do more. So how did you then with, I mean, being a strategic IT consultant to, you know, biotech and pharmaceutical industry is 
a full-time job plus, <laughs> right? And mm-hmm. then you do all of these other things in support of that or alongside that. Tell me a little bit about your role with Trans Can Work. There was a transition in my professional to personal life. And I wanted to touch upon it because that probably will give you more context in terms of why I got involved with nonprofits. So I was trying to come out in my work. And while I was successful as a businessman, I had in transition at the time, I was still struggling in my gender identity. I had come out to my wife and my wife said, hey, don't tell anyone because you're an executive in a company. You don't want to be uh, losing your job. And uh, it's going to be such a shame, you know, being in the um, IT industry. So I was doing very well as a professional. I was successful. I had built accounts. I've grown accounts. I've globally done lots of things, built operate transfer models for BPO companies, all that I can think of I've done. But personally, every time I go back to the hotel after my business presentation, I'll be sitting in my room and crying because I was going through gender dysphoria, which uh, people don't understand. Gender dysphoria is where you're born. This is the male gender, the gender that you're born versus your preferred gender, which is the gender that I love to be in, or that's my gender that I feel that is right for me. So there are a lot of people, uh, trans people, who actually have this kind of gender dysphoria because it's not aligned the way they have to think. And so that's why transgender people go through different issues. And being a professional and a consultant, I was successful in my business. And I went to a point where I I couldn't come out. Family-wise, my wife was like, oh, please don't do it. And um, I was just coming out in the wrong places. And I didn't find where I found acceptance. Unfortunately, the bars, you know, Uh, The bars is where I came out and it wasn't the ideal uh, scenario. And when I used to go out in the bars, people thought I was a prostitute and they would ask me, you know, how much are you, you know, would you come for 20 bucks? And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, they are misunderstanding me as a prostitute, but why? Not that prostitution is, you know, wrong. I have a lot of friends who are prostitutes, but for me to be associated as a prostitute because I was looking for acceptance in the wrong place, it kind of threw me off. And I was like, I have a decent family. I have a decent job. I, I just came here to have a good time. And why people are doing this to me? Is this how people are being treated? Because there is such a misconception about trans people, you know, and I wanted to change that. Why can't I be a trans person in a corporate setting and still change things? And I got, you know, abused in a bar by another transgender person. And I was going through a lot with that at 2.30 in the morning, I was sitting in the car and crying and I was thinking to myself, I have a beautiful wife, I have a beautiful family, I have a nice house here in California, I have a great job, what is wrong with me? I was struggling so hard in my head because I was not able to comprehend. I slowly started coming out socially, medically I have not transitioned, but I slowly started coming out and I got involved with organizations where I wanted to bring more awareness for people like me. And there is so much of acceptance for people who are in the blue collar jobs. You know, you can get a job as a restaurant for a trans person. There are other ways in which you can make your living. But as an executive, when I have almost 23 plus years of experience in the, in the healthcare industry. And when I came out, the job that I was offered was a case manager. And um, it was uh, so demeaning to me. And I was literally looking for a project manager job after I had built all these umpires and businesses. And I was thinking to myself as to how can this change? You know, can a person like me, uh, who is a trans person at a senior director level, can I find something which is of my own caliber rather than stepping down just because, just because I look different and I wanted to change that. And so I found a few companies and I found TransCan Work was, you know, just in LA and I was able to volunteer with them for a while, a couple of years. And then I spoke to Michaela. Michaela was very curious about my life. She was always asking, hey, Celia, can you come and, uh, you know, help us here, help us there, give some ideas. (laughs) So I got involved. And then um, uh, one fine day she said, Celia, can you please join the board? Would you like to join the board? And I said, oh, sure, I'd love to because I want to make a difference in the corporate sector. That's how I got involved in TransCan Work. (laughs) There's so much there that that I want to dive into. And I think, you know, first and foremost, this notion that somehow, you know, despite having all of this work history and all of the success and all of these qualifications, it's like you didn't change, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody went into your brain and took out all of that knowledge and all of that skill and all of that perspective. And yet you were instantly devalued in a corporate setting in terms of what people expected you to be able to offer. And I can't imagine how hard that must be. 
And I have to say, when you said that you were a successful businessman, it took a second because mm-hmm. I've only known you, you know, as an out trans woman. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I would imagine that you enjoy quite a bit of passing privilege, if I may say so. I mean, you're gorgeous. And, oh you know, you, I would never look at you and think, oh, there's a businessman, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so just that dichotomy, right? Yeah. Of, you know, like thinking about yourself mm-hmm. that way and then, and then making the transition was interesting. But, you know, I don't even know like how to unravel that because when you get treated one way, when you present it as a man versus when you present it as your authentic self and then got treated as less than, what does that tell you about, you know, this notion of meritocracy in the workplace or, you know, this notion that it's, you know, we just need to do a good job and doing a good job will be enough. I mean, it just seems like that turns it on its head. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, did an experiment. It was a very interesting experiment that I did. Uh, What I did was um, when I started coming out um, in the last company that I worked in 2017, I was trying to explain to them that I'm gender fluid and a non-op trans and uh, they didn't get it. They were like, okay, so are you going to transition or you're going to, you know, just be who you are and what, what does it mean? And I said, I'm gender fluid. Sometimes I would love to come out, you know, I, I want to express my feminine side and um, I'm not going to lose the productivity in my work. And this is who I am. This is my preferred gender. I want to be Celia and I also want to be Daniels at work. And um, this is how gender non-binary, you know, folks are. So I was uh, trying to see why the company is trying to stereotype me into the binaries. You either be a guy or you either be a girl and pick one side. We will help you transition, but you need to pick a side. Then I told them that not all of them are like me because it looks like um, you're not understood the gender non-binary side of you know how people think. And so I was educating them and I quit that company and I was trying to find a job where I could be Celia. I wanted to be Celia. And I applied for these jobs, the companies that actually fly all the pride flags during the June month. All these companies, Salesforce, Accenture, all of these companies I've tried I, uh, applying for them. And when I, I put in my resume, my whole experience, I mentioned it as Daniels and also Celia in my resume. And I also mentioned my community work and the work that I was doing in the advocacy for trans community. And also my professional experience was in my letter. And when I started looking at all these, uh, you know, I was trying to see if there's a way I can get into this industry and then bang, here, here goes everything. I went for these jobs and these interviews and unfortunately they wouldn't hire me. Almost 30 companies in LA have been in, in and out. I sent my resumes and I was very honest about who I am, but they didn't want to hire me because they saw my resume, they wanted, but then they looked at the other side and thought, this is a complicated process of a trans person being hired at a senior level. If I transition in a company that I was working, it's much more easier. But if a company wants to hire an executive from the outside as a trans person into the fabric on the framework of the company, there's a lot of change they need to do. And uh, at a junior level, it's fine. You know, they probably give you a desk and say, oh, we have trans person there. But when you're an executive, you're actually the face of the company, not just at a, a branding level, but also making a decision for the company. You're literally there in the boardroom fighting with people who are women and there are no women there, right? I mean, when you're a trans woman, you're like, why are you even here? And that is how people look at me. And um, I was not given any opportunity. And after six months of trying, then I went as Daniel. I took away all the Celia part in my resume and I was trying for a job. I took off everything and I took off the community activity. I just put it as a pure professional resume. Uh, Within one month, I had three job interviews and no questions asked. He said, we know you, we saw your resume, it looks great, please come. And uh, when I looked at it, I didn't join those companies, but I saw that there was so much of disparity between talking about diversity, talking about equality, talking about inclusion. But when it comes to actual integration of those ideas and policies and making it happen, companies always take a backseat. They move a little bit, they want to do a much more breather. But my challenge is, If you want to make a change in the company, make it at the board level. If you want to bring diversity in your company, don't just hire people so that they leave after three months. You know, that's not how you want to do it. You want to do it at a point where it's it's women's rights. Also, same thing like trans women, trans men. Everyone is valuable. You know, when you devalue a person because of their gender identity, to me, that is such a demeaning thing because I, I have not lost any of my experience. In fact, I can be even more creative and productive. To be honest with you, 
I'm more powerful. I'm more energetic as Celia than as Daniels. <laughs> and I found so much of energy. I am so happy with what's happening. People don't normally understand. And that's what I, I believe that we can change. Companies are moving the needle, but um, they are talking about it. But I just want to make sure at all levels, even in Supreme Court, or even when you make decisions about diversity, should it be taught? I would say in corporate sector, even in schools, we need to have these conversations that are really difficult. Because when you devalue a person, that becomes really hard for the person to exist in this world and live a normal life. Yeah. And I think when you keep people out of executive ranks or out of board seats because of their difference, you're missing an opportunity, not just for the talent that you're losing in that person, but the talent that you're losing in all the people in your organization that now they don't have a chance to see a path forward there. Exactly. Right. Because why would they stick around if they know that they're going to have to blaze that trail and the odds of being the one to blaze that trail from the cube farm, right, mm -hmm. is really slim. And I think it's interesting too, that you said, you know, you started with the places that flew the, the biggest pride flags in June. And I think we've seen a lot of that this year with, you know, people, you know, blacking out their logos and flying, you know, you know, supporting Black Lives Matter publicly, right? Saying all the right things. But then when you go look at the website and you see who's on their executive team, it's, you know, 13 white guys and like three white women, right? <laughs> and, you know, and you hear about, you know, the systemic racism, that's mm -hmm. intrinsic in these companies that are saying all these great things, you know, in support of Black Lives Matter, but they don't actually want to change anything internally to make that real. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a shame that so much talent is being left on the table by these organizations because, mm -hmm. my gosh, we've got so many problems to solve in this world. How can we afford to let anybody sit out? I know. Yeah. I think it's also important to focus on intersectionalities. I would say um, I've, I've looked at uh, almost all the Fortune 100 companies. I've looked at the board because I was doing a branding for a small startup company. It also depends on the industry. If it's a financial industry, you have more of white conservative men. And then if, uh, if it's a fashion industry, you have probably a few women in that. But they also have one person who's probably uh, Asian, Chinese, or you know they have some other ethnicity there or a black person. But it's just the way they want to bring some diversity because everyone is talking about it. Hey, would you like to be a part of the board? We want to make our board more color. It's okay. You know, I know what you're trying to do, but please start somewhere, you know, start somewhere. Maybe it's okay to hire even one person just to bring in some change because when you make the change right from the bathrooms to the boardrooms for trans people, that is more important because it should not be just the bathrooms. You know, oh yeah, we have a gender neutral bathroom for you. So, you know, we're very happy please give me a seat on the boardroom too. And there are a lot of people who have actually lost a uh, vice president. As you mentioned clearly, they leave the talent on the table because these are, I've seen a lot of people who are so qualified, CEOs of company who have not been able to come out because they knew that they will lose their jobs. And the ones who are successful are actually the ones who actually came out and started on their own. Like Michaela, right? Michaela started on her own and she said, I'm going to get more jobs to the trans community. And she did it. So there are a lot of people who are trying to do the best. But sometimes I, I think we also have to be patient, but I would love to see the change happening quickly before it's too late. It's not the term tenure of the CEO. It should be a long-term process when you put them in place. So let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges that trans people are facing right now and not just in the workplace, right? So we have all sorts of access issues. And I love what you said about, you know, it's, it's one thing to have a gender neutral bathroom. It's another thing to have a gender neutral board seat. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of work to do. But I think the courage that it takes to be out in trans is just so... <laughs> It's so overwhelming when we see record numbers of trans women, especially trans women of color and black trans women in particular being murdered, mm -hmm. you know, women, trans women in particular being assaulted and harassed in public restrooms and public spaces. You know, a lot of black trans women face high prosecution rates because people assume that they're prostitutes. Mm -hmm. And instead of, you know, engaging in a conversation with them in the hotel lobby, hey, how are you doing? Why are you down? they go to the room and call the police, right? Because they think that's the right thing to do somehow. And then, 
you know, the rates of suicide and attempted suicide in the trans and non-binary community is so high. And the poverty rates are so high because of people who can't get access to jobs. Like there is so much to overcome. What form does your activism take and how do you approach it? Like what aspect of that are you trying to untangle first? I think um, when you look at the whole oppression or the discrimination for a trans person, I created something called a transgender ecosystem just for people to understand. And I had given this idea to um, the Trans Latino Coalition in LA, which was uh, later presented to the California Endowment, where one of the framework that I presented to them was, if there is one trans person here, you know, what are the types of challenges they face? So I I looked at this from a 360 degree angle, where I took the perspective where if the child comes out at school, they get bullied there. When they go to college, they have different problems there because of dorm and other issues they face. And then when they go to work, of course, you know, we're talking about workplace discrimination, so many things that happen. And then they belong to certain communities. It could be faith community, it could be music community. You know, we have some issues there, um, especially when they're trying to come out. And then when you look at housing, um, that is an also another problem for transgender people. The housing issues are still a problem there. And then immigration is another issue. Healthcare is another issue. Because if you're trans and you're traveling to other countries, I'm a US citizen, but when I'm traveling to India, I have a problem because um, my passport still says Daniels. It doesn't say Celian. So I really cannot travel across the border. But my license in US, it's fine. It's, it's gender non-binary. But you don't have a gender non-binary passport. You know, that's another issue. And then when you're talking about different other aspect that I thought about was, we talked about immigration. You know, when you're talking about safety, how important it is for a person's safety. Then we're talking about if you're in jail, the system is wrong because, you know, sometimes you are, you know, if I'm arrested by the police and if I put in a, because of my birth gender, if I'm sent to a male prison, I'm done. <laughs> I don't know yeah, if I'll even no survive for an hour. For right. I, I'll be, I won't survive for an hour there. Even an hour, I'm dead. And then when you think about when the person is getting old, how would you like to bury the person based on the dignity, uh, giving them the dignity of being who they are, or just because you think your family wants to bury them as the way you perceive them? So if you take the transgender ecosystem, as a lot of oppression in the whole 360 degree angle everywhere. It's a lot. And I didn't know where to start. <laughs> I was looking at it and um, I was thinking, let me first discover myself. Who is Celia? Who is this person inside Daniels? Why is she there? I was in denial for many years. I didn't want Celia because I was married to a beautiful woman and I'm still attracted to women. I'm not attracted to men. So I always had this confusion that I was, whether I'm gay or not, or what's going on with me, am I a cross-dresser or do I have gender identity issues? And then I was started doing research. Now, when you read research, I mean, I'm, since I was in healthcare, I, I knew things. I was reading about policies. I was reading about everything. And I found that the research about trans people, which is like 1.7 million trans folks who live in the U.S., there's not much of research on that. You know, there's just a few articles I found in Stanford, John Hopkins, and a few Harvard Medical. They've written some articles, but not too much focus about why we need to help transgender community. But it was so easy. And I, I started learning about it, and I thought, I need to educate everyone. You know, let me start educating people about me. And I, then I started accepting myself. To, I, was, I, I accepted myself and I started explaining to my wife about me. And she was in denial for a long time because she didn't want to see her husband as a woman. You know, it was hard for her. I mean, she's an Indian cisgender woman and her husband is trans. And for her, it was like, oh my God, this is too much, you know. <laughs> and uh, she was learning. She was learning along with me. And uh, 17 years it took for her to accept me. We've been married for 23 years. It took 17 years for her to accept me. And my daughter is now, I came out to her when she was 15 years old. Now she's 20 years old and she's very accepting. You know, so I have a, a healthy family life. My wife is accepting, my daughter is accepting, and they all really appreciate and they know everything that's happening. So I thought about it and I thought, where can I start? Then I thought about the younger generation. My daughter accepted me in 25 minutes. My wife took 17 years to accept. Why? It's because she was born in a different culture a different time, like me, you know, I'm just one year elder to her. So I looked at all the disparity and I started focusing on uh, younger generation, any issues that they are going through. And I just wanted to help the younger trans folks who are coming out because I went through a lot when I was a child, I tried committing suicide. I was always, always suicidal. I went through public shaming in India. 
it wasn't easy you know um, being an executive now it's all nice and fancy to people when they think about it but i worked in india i was born in india i suffered a lot in india i went through a lot in india too but i know how difficult it is for the children to come out because the parents wouldn't accept so early education i wanted to change as to where is the fundamental problem and how do we change it when you have a family that's accepting and then the child will thrive i think that is where i started focusing my energy and then of course i would love to go through the entire 360 degree spectrum of helping in every space but i chose healthcare because that is really important for every human being and when trans people are denied healthcare because they say your gender identity is different to me that is like why would you do that <laughs> we are human beings don't do that you know we are human beings we need to go to the bathroom don't do that we don't want to go to the bathroom and harass anyone there i mean where you want me to go to a male bathroom i can't i mean i i really cannot and that's where i think we need to change the whole fragment of uh, the fundamental system the systemic when you call about the systemic depression or the systemic way in which the whole country is ostracizing the trans community this is where it is happening too you know like black lives matter is so important because it's been happening a lot of systemic discrimination over 400 years trans people have always been there right from the dawn of times 4000 year old culture <laughs> hello this is nothing new gender fluidity was always there in india 4000 years back now everyone says oh what happened it's so fashionable to come out as trans no it is not this is not a life choice it's and you know in a lot life. of places in the world my understanding correct me if i'm wrong but in a lot of places in the world there was not this binary of gender yeah. and it wasn't until colonialism spread mm-hmm. throughout the world and you know the european religious doctrines started permeating right. other cultures that these things even became taboo in a lot of places or became you know a source of discrimination or shame and you know i'm wondering like how much decolonization did you have to do of your own mind and your own identity you know to come to an understanding and appreciation of who Celia is that's an amazing question and i wanted to quickly touch upon it without going in detail because india as a country has always been very gender fluid and very spectrum this is a spectrum in sexual orientation as a spectrum in gender fluidity till the colonials came down there and they put a binary rule uh, they they criminalized people like who are trans or who are in same sex relationship so they all went into hiding and when i came out in india the only people that i could identify were the hijra community and hijra community is nothing but these are people who have been rejected by the families if your family has thrown you outside the home the only place you could go is everyone would take a train or bus and go to mumbai and they would find refuge there because that's where they were hosting all these people and they had a system of taking care of trans community and it was very religious based too that's why it's hijra community and there are other people in india who are trans but they don't identify with the religious hijra hindu culture uh, like me if i come out i cannot identify with the hijra community because i'm a christian so for me uh, coming out and identifying with the hijra community would have been really hard so when i saw that kind of uh, decolonization the only thing that hit me was i identify with you i am you but i don't want to be you and that is how i was thinking about myself i don't want to be a beggar like you i don't want to be a street performer like you i don't want to be a sex worker like you but i am you i identify with you and one of the reasons why i didn't come out in my childhood is because if i had come out my only two choices if my parents had kicked me out join a hijra community become a trans person and doing all this performance in india that's a survival there's no way you can study there's no way you can do that or kill myself i tried killing myself because i didn't want to do this a lot of self harm but i didn't find that really helpful because the decolonization could really cause so much of damage to the trans and the lgbtq community in india which was not there at all and that's why now we are also educating the indian community we're taking all the mythology the ancient hindu ideas and ideologies and uh, talking about the gods and goddesses and saying that this is how indian culture was why was this messed up over a period of years and if you can accept a hindu culture why do you discriminate a transgender person 
Now it's so interesting when when you give them the idea that you learn from the history, right? <laughs> you don't create your own history. You have to learn from the history to be more better person over the period of centuries and centuries. And I don't know why you rightly touched upon a point where 33 trans women were just killed this year. There's so much of issues and colonization that has happened that has taken off this beautiful spectrum in every country, in every culture, like the Native American culture has close to five genders. So there are a lot of things that happened. And yeah, that's one of the reasons why I think it should be, we need to go and re-educate history, learn from history, uh, move on to what we can do better in our future. Absolutely. And from a multicultural perspective, so Mm -hmm. that people can understand that where we are in this moment, our current understanding of who people are, who people could be, is not how it's always been. And it's not the only way to be. And I applaud you, Celia, seeing the options, right? The obvious options in front of you and say, that's not who I am. I'm capable of something different. I want to do something different. And I can't Mm -hmm. imagine how much resilience and courage and just inner strength it has taken for you to be the amazing woman that you are, but also, you know, with all of the success in your career and, you know, with a strong family unit, you know, I'm very blessed to know you. And I'm very grateful that you're here with us. And I'm very grateful for your voice and your work and your contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amy, for giving me this opportunity. I'm blessed too for having a wonderful family and beautiful allies like yourself. And you're a part of the community. I'm so thankful for this platform. (laughs) Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm back with Celia Daniels. And I had mentioned in her bio that she's a musician. And so I asked her after we you know, wrapped up the interview, what do you play? And she said, well, she plays guitar. She's a songwriter. And we're actually going to close this episode out with a song that she wrote. And Celia, can you tell me, uh, our audience, a little bit about this song, what it means to you, and tell us a little bit about the harmonies? In the music. Absolutely. <laughs> so I, um, I play the guitar and I uh, write songs. I've written a lot of songs, more than 40 songs in my life. And most of them are about the uh, issues that I was going through. Um, when I was in dark moments, I used to write a song. But during the Transgender Day of Remembrance in 2011, when I went to the first Transgender Day of Remembrance, I was um, just looking at the pictures of trans people getting killed because of who they are. You know, they have not done any harm. They have not committed any crime, but they were just murdered because they were trans. And um, I was just crying, (laughs) you know, standing in the, in the audience, I was um, thinking about it. And, you know, I was thinking I should do something about it. You know, how do I express this? And I have spoken a lot about it. I have all this also even uh, conducted safety workshops for that. But one thing that hit me was as a musician, what am I going to do? So I wrote this song about a transgender murder. And I also brought in a lot more hope and, um, um, you know, that we will not be erased and lots of aspects into it where I sang as Celia and I also sang as Daniels and then I harmonized both. Um, so I think uh, I did a more gender fluid vocals into it. And I, uh, I had some amazing musicians who played from uh, uh, the Music Institute in Hollywood. And um, it was interesting because um, I was not planning to sing the song. <laughs> I was having a professional singer sing the song and um, they told me, hey, um, you need to sing because this is your song. And uh, can you sing? And I said, no, I'm not sung as Celia, but I can sing as Daniels. And so I, I tried. And uh, so I, I sang as Celia and I also uh, harmonized in my Daniels voice just to give a variety that um, I'm a person of two spirits. You know, all of us have wonderful spirits in our life and we enhance it through music, through art, through creativity, through spectrums of color through anything that we can do, whether, well, you know, innovation, everything that matters. So to me, the song is, um, and I can, I'll, I'll, I will be playing the song, but uh, to me, the song is so personal because um, I was always um, amazed at the fact that how do we keep moving on with life when we have so much of oppression? I know we talked about it, but, um, you know, uh, please listen to the song. It's, um, it's amazing. And I, I believe that, um, when we express ourselves through music, uh, it's it's always so comforting for me. And I did that. Hope it is comforting to you as well when you're listening to the song. Thank you so much. And I, I love the way you encapsulated that about, you know, let us not be erased. Because mm-hmm. I think it's so important that people are remembered and that we appreciate people when they're here and we don't forget them when they're gone. Thank you, Celia, so much. Thank you, Amy. Soon pass away.
way Lost can never change your heart Only love can do It can never heal the heart Only love can do Love can do Yo, Amy, that was incredible. Thank you. Yeah, you know, this week, for those who don't know, um, we're airing this episode on November 21st. Yesterday, um, November 20th, was Trans Day of Remembrance in 2020. And, you know, that's the day that we honor the lives lost in the trans community, specifically lives lost to violence and suicide. And I want to be very clear about this for people who don't know, and this is not like an upbeat thing to end the show on. So we got to do something after this to kind of pick us up. Right. But 2020 is seeing the worst violence ever against the trans community, against trans people, trans women of color and black trans women in particular are especially vulnerable. And we have set a record every year for at least the last four years in terms of the number of murders of of black and brown trans women. So this is something that we all need to be aware of and, you know, step up and show our support anywhere we can because people's lives truly are on the line. You're hundred percent right. And I'm glad I'm honored one that we're able to have this conversation and that song, that song was incredible. And I love that, you know, she harmonizes. So I say she, I spoke with Celia. She's gender fluid, she identifies as a, as a non-op trans woman. And so while I refer to her, she, she sang in both her male and her female voices and harmonized with herself in that song. I mean, it was just incredible. You know, you talk about talent, right? To be able to not only write and produce and I mean, my gosh, I can barely play a song on iTunes, right? <laughs> much less on a guitar with my voice. So just, just incredible what she's doing, what she's capable of doing. And, you know, just a a great reminder that we need this talent in the world and and we shouldn't overlook it. A hundred percent. Shout out to Celia. Shout out to the trans community. Shout out to black trans women. And, you know, shout out to you, Amy. This is good work. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is good. Thank you. I'm I'm, I'm thankful and I'm excited for you. And uh, thank you for your your presence here. I'm just so glad to have a platform to share these stories. I mean... It's a blessing. It's a blessing for us all to be doing what we're doing. I'm, I'm curious, you know, you said in it on a light note. I feel like we had a conversation. So, like, you know, you're not a musical person, but you do like limericks. <laughs> I don't know if I can do a limerick on Trans Remembrance Day. That's a little too light. That's way too, that is too light. That's, That's too light. It's do, a little too. We're, we're not, we're not, we're not that kind of podcast. We can't do that. We but you catch that. me next week and, and we'll, we'll do a limerick next week. I promise. There we go. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I will I will leave you with this, though. Well, to you, if you want to hear more voices like Celia's, if you want to hear more stories like this one, the best way to do that is to support Living Corporate. And there are a number of ways you can do that. The easiest way is as soon as you're done listening to this episode, go give us a five star rating and write us a quick review. And, you know, there are other ways to support us as well. Right, Zach? There are other ways to support us. You know what you can do is you can just tell a friend about us. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Tell a family member, right? Tell your crazy uncle. Oh my goodness, wait. This is going to air right before Thanksgiving. Mm. Yo, so this is what you need to do. Send this episode to the family member that you like to annoy because you don't agree with their political (laughs) and social views. And then when y'all have y'all's Zoom Thanksgiving, bring it up. In fact, what you could also do, you know, is just like send it to the entire family, right? It's really good conversation content. Yeah. Hey, here's a real person that our policies affect. And let's talk about that. Yeah. Ooh, bravery. I love it. I'm just saying, I mean, what what do you have to lose? You're not going to see him. Well, you shouldn't be seeing him in person anyway. Well, that's true. You know what I mean? I would hope that people are staying home. Stay home, everybody. Just stay home. Zoom. Thanksgiving Zoom. The CDC is out here saying don't even travel. Don't even go there. Yeah. Don't, don't even go. So, yeah, no, um, look. This has been great. I appreciate you, Amy. Thank you so much. Shout out again to Celia. And uh, we'll catch y'all next time. Take care. Peace.
Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.